got your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn with me once again to the New Testament book of Colossians. Uh, so Colossians chapter 1, still going to be looking at verses 15 through 23 this morning. Uh, and if you have missed the last couple weeks, just let me say that we've been in this study now uh, for three weeks. And so in the first couple weeks, what we have seen uh, is basically... Paul giving our version of, hey, how's your all's mom and them, right? So he's basically saying, hey, how's everything going? How is life treating you? I've heard some good things about you. I'm praying for you. And look, I hope sincerely that you took last week's message, and this past week you've been praying for one another, lifting up one another, that we may grow in the knowledge of God and, and live lives that are pleasing to Him. That's what we've been seeing at the introduction of this letter. But now this morning... So after the introduction segment of what we're seeing here, where we find ourselves today is really at the heart of this letter. So man, this is the point in the conversation with our wives that they make us make direct eye contact with them so we're listening to what they are saying, right? Because for some reason they think that we can't watch TV and be on our phones and eat and listen to them at the same time. Look, this is where Paul's like, okay, we need you to listen right here because this is the crux, this is the heart of what you're going to be seeing throughout the rest of this letter. Like everything else that Paul's going to go on to say in the next three chapters stems from what we're about to read. And look, this morning I want to tell you, like, I would love for us to memorize these verses and then come back next week and us recite them together. But I think we learned last week we are just not capable of that, are we? Like, we just don't have that ability. If you missed last week, what you missed was a train wreck of us trying to recite a couple verses together. But church, I tell you, these are important. Like, let this soak in what Paul is saying here in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 23. Because after Paul has just got through saying, hey, here's what God has done for us. He's equipped us. He's enabled us to be transferred, like I said, out of that kingdom of darkness. So out of the sin that had killed us off. And now he's made it to where we can enter into the kingdom through his son. After he said, so through the son, we now have redemption. We now have forgiveness of sins. We then go on to see Paul give to the church at Colossae. Some of the most powerful, some of the most thought-provoking words ever recorded. He then goes on to give us this morning one of the most reality-shattering pieces of Scripture found anywhere in Scripture. So let's just read this hymn, this poetic praise that we see from Paul, and then we'll pray. As we read in God's Word, Colossians 1.15 says, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. In verse 18, for now, he's also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place, so that he might come to have preeminence in everything. And we're going to cover a couple more verses, but for now, let's just pray and ask God to move as we preach this morning. Father, we come to you. Just acknowledge your goodness as we sing. In the opening song, God, you are so good. You love us so much. And God, we just praise you. We thank you that we, if we receive Christ, are your people. We're the sheep of your pastor. God, we just want to praise you and rejoice in you. We want to bring songs before you because you are so worthy. And so we just ask this morning for the Holy Spirit to be active for us to die to self or any sin that may be hindering us from hearing this word of truth, God, would we remove it? Would we repent of the sinfulness of our lives? God, would we see you clearly? Would we not hear these words and remain the same, but would we be ever changed through your word of hope? We thank you. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. So now, church, before we start to break down this text, let me go ahead and say that you all should be thanking me because we could spend hours and hours and hours just in these few verses. Like as we read this, and I hope you understood and kind of sensed the depthness of it, this is just so deep here in what Paul is getting at, what he's saying. Like, who is Jesus? You know, for time's sake today, 
in light of what we just read, I just want to ask one simple question to kind of get us in the right way of thinking. I want you to think about this question. How would you personally describe Jesus? So if somebody were to come up to you and say, hey, I need a description of the Jesus of the Bible. I need you to describe what is this man named Jesus like? How would you respond? And as we think about that, that question is kind of simple on the surface, right? But I think the more that we really think about it, it gets harder and harder to describe this Jesus. Because if you were asked that question, maybe some of your answers would be, if you had to describe Jesus, you'd say, well, Jesus was a good man, and he was. Maybe you'd say, well, he was the perfect man, and he was. Maybe you'd say, well, Jesus was the God-man. Maybe you'd say he was a great prophet. He was a great teacher. He was a great healer. Maybe you'd go to Isaiah 9 and say, hey, here's who Jesus is. He's the everlasting Father. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the Prince of Peace. Maybe you'd say he's the Messiah. Now, Jesus, he's the king. He's the ruler. He is the Savior. He's the Son of God. And listen, while none of these descriptions would be wrong, like while all of these are characteristics of Christ, would we not agree it still does not do full justice to who Jesus really is? I mean, would we not agree that it's a pretty difficult task to describe who Jesus is and feel like that we got our point wholly across? Like for us to describe Jesus and then for us to walk away from that conversation thinking, now I nailed that. I could not have described this Jesus any better. Now look, you can describe somebody like me and get your point across in about eight seconds, right? Like if somebody asks you, how would you describe Jesse? Average, right? Average height, average weight, average intelligence, average ambition, average everything, right? Above average golfer, and if you know, you know. Some of you know. But look, to think about the task of describing Jesus in a way that really captures his full essence, in a way that actually does him justice is something very hard, if not impossible, to do. It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, thanks be to God for this what kind of gift? This indescribable gift. Paul's like, how do you even put Jesus into words? It's like Shailen said in his song, Glory to God. And it's a rap song, so if anybody wants to drop a beat while I read this, we can do that too. I told Lauren, I said, hey, I'm going to do a rap song. She said, come again? What did you say? But he said this. Imagine it. I can't explain the half of it. Our brains can't even fathom it. And language is inadequate to characterize the Lord on the throne. With spiritual eyes, his story is known. From him and through him and to him is everything. Surely to God be the glory alone. And now you're thinking, man, we've got to describe Jesse as an above average rapper now too, right? That's what you're thinking. Listen, like we mentioned a couple weeks ago, as we're just introing this letter, we said that when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Colossae, what he was really doing, what he was really trying to get across, he was trying to counteract these false teachers. So what you had in Colossae was this group of heretical teachers who were seeking to replace the Colossians' enthusiastic devotion to Christ and instead make them have only a mild approval of him. So like we said, these false teachers, they weren't encouraging anyone to forget Jesus altogether. No, that was not their ploy. No, they were saying, hey, Jesus is good, but he's not the only show in town. And so according to these false teachers, Jesus would get equal billing. He was to be on the same level with a vast number of other spirits and other people. In other words, here's what they were saying. They're saying, hey, in your life, it's okay for Jesus to be prominent. That's fine. That's acceptable. But he must not be, he cannot be preeminent. And long story short, Paul, the Apostle Paul, would not have it. Like he wanted to make it abundantly clear that Jesus was not, will not ever be one among many. No, Jesus is the one and only. And so how does Paul go about getting his point across that Jesus is not to be one among many. No, he's to be the one and only. That Jesus is to be preeminent. That he's to be first place in every area of our lives. He starts off by reminding them. By describing Jesus as the one who is supreme over all creation. And I don't know about you. But if my goal is to make 
somebody see how important someone else is. So if I'm trying to get you to understand the magnitude and the significance of a person, if I let you know that they are above every single thing that's ever been created, that seems like a pretty good place to start, does it not? But they just seem smart. But let's go back to verse 15, where he starts us off by saying that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And again, this is one of those statements, that the more that we think about it, the more that we actually should become blown away by it. Because Paul is saying, listen, if you want to know what Jesus is like, so if you want to know who God is, just look at his son. Get this today, church. We don't believe in some God of our imagination. Like, we don't believe in some God that we've just conjured up in our minds, like who we want him to be. No, we believe in the God of revelation. God has revealed himself in his son. It's like we're in John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. Nobody here this morning can say, hey, I've seen God. But that's okay. Because it says, but the one and only son who is himself God, he has revealed him. He goes on to say there in verse 15. Not only is he the image of the invisible God, he is the firstborn over all creation. And you see, when you go to that word there, firstborn, in the Greek, that word is prototokos. And what this word means is not that Jesus was the first one ever born. So this is not being first in relation to time. No, this is first as in relation to rank. This means that he is supreme in rank. It means that he is more valuable, that he is more precious than anyone ever has been. It's like we can read in Psalms 89, 27. I think we've got some issues going on the screen, so just think about this verse, write it down. But Psalms 89, 27 says, I will also make him, speaking of King David, my firstborn. So it means that God would make him and did make him the greatest, the most supreme of all the kings of the earth. So think about it like this. Think about being firstborn over all creation, like the top 25 rankings that come out in college sports. And so if you don't know what that is, what they do, with different sports in college, they just take the top 25 teams in different sports, and they rank them 1 to 25. But if we're to think about what Paul is saying here like that, he's saying, hey, you might look at this list. So you might take rankings 2 through 25, and they might look different from the next person. So you might have as number two in your list of supreme rankings, good, healthy relationships. That's a good thing, right? Maybe in your life, that's number two on the supreme, on the priority list. Maybe number three, you might have having a job you enjoy. Maybe number four, you might have, hey, in my supreme rankings, just being content, just being happy in life. Maybe number five on your rankings would be intimacy with your spouse. And the husbands in the room are like, yeah, that's definitely top five, right? And the wives are like, that's probably not making top 100 on my list of things that are supreme. Look, while we may interchange the rankings from 2 to 25, while we might interchange the rankings even from 2 to 100, number one on that list must be reserved. It has to be for the firstborn over all creation. Listen, friends, what we're seeing here is that Jesus must be placed above. He must be ranked above wealth. He must be ranked above success. He must be ranked above sex. He must be ranked above sports. He must be ranked above power. He must be ranked above pleasure. Why? Because that is his only rightful place. And you see, why is that? Why is that only his rightful place? Why must he be recognized as supreme over all creation? Because what we go on to read in verse 16, that he is actually the author of creation. As we read, for everything. Let's just stop and think about the magnitude of what Paul is saying. This is not hyperbole. For everything was created by him. You see, this basically shuts down one of the many major issues when it comes to Jehovah Witnesses. You see, what Jehovah Witnesses believe, they believe that Jesus didn't do the creating. No, they believe that he was created. So to them, Jesus is not divine. No, he's just somewhat unique. But you see, that cannot be true. Because what we see here is that Jesus was not created. No, he has always been. It's like somebody said, Jesus has always been hasing. Jesus was always wasing. 
He's always been the agent of creation since the beginning of time. But where was he creating? As we read on, in heaven and on earth. He's creating the visible, the invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. And look, we're going to get more into this as we move on in this book. But these thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, they're speaking of different classes of spiritual beings. So we're talking about different ranks, different classes of angels, both good and bad. And again, like we said, some of the problem, so some of the false teaching arising in Colossae was stemming from the worship of angels. And so Paul here is simply saying, why would you ever think about, why would you even consider worshiping angels when you could be worshiping, when you could be praising the one who actually created the angels? Look for us, why would we consider worshiping? Why in our lives would we consider putting our time and attention on anything else? We could focus our time and attention on the one who created everything else. Because as we read on, we see all things, all things have been created through him and for him. You see, friends, the picture that Paul is painting here is that everything, everything began with Christ and everything will end with Christ. It's like we read in Revelation 22, 13. He's the beginning and he's the what, church? the beginning and the end he's the alpha and the what and the omega he's the first and the last and one day everything and everyone will give him glory and why will everything and every one of us give him glory because what we've just read that everything from the microscopic to the cosmic so everything from the physical to the spiritual everything from the biological to the geological so everything and everybody from Beijing to Bulls Gap, everything and everybody from Moscow to Mossam, from Germany to G Vegas, everything we see and everything that we are unable to see has been created by him and for him. Which means what? If everything has been created by him and for him, that means every single thing belongs to him. You see, one of the biggest fights that my girls have, and they fight a lot. Like, don't tell anybody this, but I really think we're terrible parents. We tried, we tried, but we failed. And we've accepted it, now we're just trying to do the best we can. What they always want to fight over is what belongs to who. Like, it doesn't matter what it is or who it actually belongs to. The other one wants it. And you know what they're going to say when they want it? That's mine. That's mine. That's my jammies. Those are my Barbies. Those are my toys. That's my flashlight. That's my cup. That's my knife. Now, we don't really let them play with knives, but it's getting to the point we might start doing that. We don't know what we're doing. But listen, church, I get so tired. I get so tired of hearing them say, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. But listen, as I was studying this, you know what? I was reminded, well, we should not get tired of hearing. What we shouldn't get tired of thinking about. No, actually, it should amaze us. That Jesus at any moment, think about this, at any moment, he can look at anything in the entire universe and say, hey, you see that there? That's mine. Hey, you see that over here? That's mine too. It's like what Abraham Copper said. He's a former prime minister of the Netherlands. He said this, there is not a square inch, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of the human existence over which Christ who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine, mine. You see, this is what Paul is saying. He's saying everything is his. It's all by him. It's all for him. It's all about him. Look, if that's not enough, not only is it all by him, is it all for him, is it all about him, it's also all sustained through him. Look at verse 17. He is before all things. And by Him, all things do what, church? All things hold together. In other words, Jesus is the glue in the universe. And we all know what happens when the glue stops holding, right? When the glue stops holding everything, the glue is holding falls apart. 
You see, God the Father and Jesus the Son, they are still actively involved in sustaining their creation. They're actively involved in sustaining you and me moment by moment. And so moment by moment, I know we don't think about this hardly ever, but just think about this moment by moment, nanosecond by nanosecond. Jesus keeps the universe going while at the same time he keeps us from becoming like a character in a sci-fi movie where we just disintegrate into nothingness. This is what Paul says. He says, without his sustaining power, you know what would happen? What would happen is that everything would literally fall apart. That everything would revert back to the nothingness. Back to the chaos that existed before God and Jesus got to work in Genesis 1. It's like we read in Hebrews 1.3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. And the exact expression of his nature. But what is he doing? He's sustaining all things. And how is he sustaining it? By his powerful word. You see, when we truly understand this, that he holds all things together, that he is actually the sustainer of all things. Like, you are not holding your life together. Hear me, brother. Hear me, sister. No, Jesus is holding your life together. And when we understand this truth, that as one scholar put it, that what Jesus is doing, he is keeping the cosmos from becoming chaos. It doesn't make any sense that we would ever look for meaning and purpose anywhere else in life. I mean, think about just common sense wise. Would it not make sense that if Jesus is truly the one who has created all things and who holds all things together, that he would be the one that when we are hurting, and some of you here this morning, some of you watching online, you're hurting, that when we're questioning, that when we're suffering, that when we're confused, that when we're angry, that when we're depressed, that when we're worried, that he should be the one that we run to, that he should be the one that we cling to. I mean, if he's the one who is sovereign, who is powerful over all things, if Jesus can hold together every atom, did you know for a long time and even now, scientists have a hard time explaining how atoms stay together. Jesus says, I can tell you how they sit together because I hold them together. But if he can hold together every atom, every molecule, every strand of DNA, if he can hold together every star, every galaxy, what makes you think that he can't hold you together when you feel like in your life that you are falling apart? What makes you think? What makes me think that I'm going to find happiness and peace, and satisfaction, and joy apart from Him. How are we going to find it outside the One whom all things in heaven and earth have been created by and for? So Paul says, here's how I describe Jesus. He's supreme over all creation. But not only is He supreme over all creation, He is supreme in the church. Look, we're going to hit this in a hurry. As we read in verse 18, He drops down and says, He's also, just so you know, the head of the body, the church. And we see this talk in different places in Scripture, that Jesus is the head of the church. And what does that mean? It means simply that Jesus is the one who has all authority in the church. It means that just like the head controls everything the body does, so it is with Christ and His church. That everything in this church has to be done under His direction, under His guidance, through His Word. But He's the head of the church He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And again, firstborn here. This has nothing to do with time. So this is not saying, understand, that Jesus was the first person to ever raise from the dead. That's not true. No, there were many others that you can see in the Scripture who preceded Jesus in rising from the dead. But again, what the idea here is this. Is if you had to rank the top ten resurrections of all time. Which would be kind of an interesting thing to do, right? Like, if you're getting together tonight with some people to rank resurrections, I'm kind of interested and kind of concerned at the same time. But what it says here is that Jesus' resurrection, in that ranking, it would come in at number one. Like, his resurrection was par excellence. And why was that? Because others, you see, were raised to die again. But Jesus Christ was raised not to die again. Jesus Christ was the first person to raise from the dead to ultimately conquer death. And again, we ask the question, but why did he raise from the dead? Well, Paul tells us, so that he might come to have first place. So that he might come to have first place in everything. 
And you see, here is really the crux of what Paul is saying. Here is what he's been working towards, and here's what he's going to be working from in the next two and three chapters, that Christ would be preeminent. That Christ would come to have first place in every single aspect of our lives. And look, let's just be honest. This is nothing that we're not used to hearing, is it? Like, I truly don't believe that's going to catch you off guard for me to tell you directly, hey, Jesus needs to be priority number one in your life. I don't think you're going to hear that and go, that's shocking. I don't think it's going to catch you off guard for me to say, hey, he should be your ultimate allegiance, your supreme priority in all that you do. Like, I don't think you're going to hear that and think, man, I never knew that. But listen, because that's the case, I feel like a more important question then the question, do you know that Jesus should be number one? Do you know that Jesus should be supreme in your life? I think a better question is this. How do you know if he is? How do you know if he actually is number one? If he actually is supreme in your life? Is that not the question that we would like to answer? And I tell you, here's how you know. Simply put, here's how you know if Jesus is preeminent in your life. You see, Jesus is preeminent in your life when he's become prominent in your thoughts. Let me ask you, how often? How often do you give thought to the things that are important to you? I'd say for most of us all the time, right? Like when something is really important to us, we can't hardly help but think about it, can we? Even when we try not to, it's constantly there. It's always running through our brains. I mean, for me, you know, one of the things that's just so important to me, that means so much to me, that I'm constantly thinking about cows right like all the time i'll be sitting on the couch and i'll be going like this you know and lauren will say you're thinking about cows aren't you i'll say no i'm not thinking about cows why would i sit there and think about cows then i'll turn around like man if i get that cow to 500 pounds like if i could get this cow to do this for me but look church we think about this i ask you this question how many of your thoughts gravitate towards the things of christ i ask you how often are you thinking about the things of God and the beauty of God and the holiness of God. How often are you thinking about how can I live a life that's pleasing to Him? It's like we read in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, take every thought, take every single thought as much as we can captive to obey Christ. And so if He is preeminent, He is going to be prominent in your thoughts. But not only is He going to be prominent in your thoughts, but He's also going to take precedent over your actions Look, this morning, if you really want to know where God and Christ actually fall in your rankings, the two best places to check for you to know where they fall in your rankings is your calendar and your checkbook. Like, let me tell you, where you spend your money and where you spend your time are probably the two best indicators of what is actually ranked number one in your life, no matter what you say is ranked number one in your life. Like, if I were to look at your checkbook, if I were to see your calendar with everything written down that you were planning on doing, I truly believe that I would know pretty quickly what's important to you, and I also believe that I'd know pretty quickly what's not important to you. And if I saw your checkbook, and I saw in it that you never tithe, that you never give any money towards missions, that you never give any of your money towards those who are hurting and suffering, it's going to make me question if God is really supreme in your life. Like if I looked in your calendar and I saw that you had three weekends a month or even four weekends a month marked out for what you want to do. It's marked out with my hobbies, with my interests, with all these different things, with my entertainment, with our vacations, with our sports. And I'll think maybe I'll give one Sunday out of the month to be obedient to what God has commanded to gather with the people. Then maybe just maybe that's a good indicator that God ain't number one in your life. Maybe that's a good indicator that God ain't number one in my life. And so how do you know if he's preeminent, if he's first place? If he's prominent in your thoughts? If he takes precedent over what you do? And thirdly, you know if he's actually first place when he holds priority over your ambitions. Which just leads us to the question, what is it you're living for? Is your ambition, is your goal to make a name for yourself? Is it to make life comfortable for you and your family? Or is it to do what we're commanded to do? To make much known of Christ and the gospel, even to the ends of the earth. 
Look, I'm not bashing anybody. I'm asking myself and my family the same questions. Is this true of my life? As we think through these things, if these things are true of your life, then it's pretty clear that God is supreme. But if they're not, it's pretty clear that He is not supreme. This is how you know if God is preeminent in your life. Look, maybe you're here and you're a little bit like me. Like, man, I don't know about all these things in my life. Like, I don't know if I match up to all three of these. I think a good question then becomes, how do you get there, right? How do you change where maybe God's not number one, where Christ is not supreme in your life? How do you get to where he is? Well, brothers and sisters, you do just what Paul has said. You focus on the truths that he's just presented. You ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, to remind you constantly that Christ is supreme over all creation. You ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that not only is he supreme over all creation, but also finally wrap up today by seeing this, that Christ was supreme over the cross. You see, in this text, as you study it, what you're going to see, it goes from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. So what you see, what you've got is the cosmic Christ who created everything. Now what we're seeing is a crucified Christ who came to restore everything. Let's read in verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile. Look, what does it mean to reconcile? It means to restore, right? It means to return something back to its proper order. So to put something back like it's supposed to be. It says he's going to reconcile everything to himself. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. And how would Jesus go about reconciling? How would he go about reconciling everything to himself? He goes about making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Look, that we would just stop and consider this truth. That every fleshly act, that every lustful thought, that every impure motive, every lie, every slanderous word, every selfish act, every evil deed we've ever done should bring about the wrath of God. Let me just stop for a second and consider that. Every single evil thing that you've done or that I've done should bring about the wrath of God. That's why Paul says in verse 21, once you are alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. But you see now, if you are in Christ, so if you have repented of your sin, if you've turned away from your former life and surrendered your heart and life to Jesus as Lord, as supreme, look, maybe you're here today and you're an unbeliever. I ask you, would you see Jesus as supreme? Would you repent of your sin as we think about that, as we think about our sinfulness, we also did all of it, that every last ounce of our evilness, if we were in Christ, has been canceled. It's been set aside and nailed to the cross, thereby satisfying for all eternity the wrath of God. That's why he says in verse 22, but now he has reconciled you. This is how you used to live, but now he's restored you by his physical body through his death to present you holy faultless and blameless before him and church i ask you just to think about if this is what jesus has done for you if he's created you if he's sustaining you if he's given a way to reconcile you how could you not give him first place how could you not make him first place in everything it's like shylin said the rest of that song let us consider let us consider the god who was there Possessing a glory that's not to be shared. God versus anyone, not even fair. How could you dare even try to compare the self-existent, self-sufficient, omnipotent, beneficent, faithful God whose word we can trust, perfectly holy and perfectly just. His beauty, there's no end to it. Transcendent is infinite. Knowledge and wisdom intricate. Steadfast love is intimate. We see in his laws, he is the boss. Nothing about him is evil or false. Pure perfection, zero flaws. All of his attributes meet at the cross. The place where Jesus Christ was smashed to satisfy God's righteous wrath. Rose from the grave on my behalf through faith in Christ. He now lights our path. Makes believers part of his fam. How does that holy God pardon a man? Perhaps even harder to understand. From the beginning, this was part of his plan 
how does that not lead us to worship? How does it not lead us to say, okay, anything else in my life is going to fall under his supremeness. He is going to become actually number one, not just in word, but in action and in truth. And so I close out this morning by asking you, by going back to that question, how would you describe Jesus? I ask you, would you truly be able to describe this very Jesus as rank number one? Would you actually, if you were telling the honest truth, be able to tell somebody, hey, this Jesus is supreme. He's the most important. He's the most crucial. He's the most vital part of my life. Or for like so many professing Christians, who, by the way, may not actually even be Christians, is he simply just an add-on? Is he just somebody that you give a little thought to on Sundays, but ignore him the rest of the week? Hear me, brothers and sisters, I love you. But we have to understand what Jesus says in his word. He says that I am Lord of all, or I'm not Lord at all. In your life, he is Lord over everything, or he is Lord over nothing. Like if we were to follow Jesus' words and be true disciples of Christ, then he must be described. It must be demonstrated that he is a supreme thing in our lives. He must be the one thing, actually, that all other things are shaped by. He must be first place in our relationships. And he must shape our relationships. He must be first place in our homes, and he must shape our homes. He must be first place in our studies, in our vocation. He must shape the studies and vocations. He must be first place in our time. He must be first place in our finances. First place in our conversations. First place in our pursuits. He must have first place in everything. Because he will settle for nothing less. Is this true of your life? And if it's not, would you repent? Would I repent of anything that I've placed above holy God and his righteousness and truth? Let's pray. God, we thank you for what we can read in your word. We thank you, God, for your Son, who is your exact image. God, we just pray right now, asking forgiveness. We know that we fail you so many ways. But God, as we hear, as we listen to these words, would we be a people who meditate upon them? Would we examine ourselves, the Scripture tells us to do? We look at our own lives and say, okay, here is where I'm missing it. Here's where Jesus is not preeminent. He's not first place in my life. And would we surrender? Would we lay it down? Is it easy? No. But is it worth it? Yes. God, we thank you for the message of the cross. I pray, God, there's anybody here this morning that is still in their sin, that is still dead to Christ, that they would be awakened to come to life. God, help us to see that this is where true life is found. It's found through your Son. God, as we sing, God, we just pray and ask the Spirit to move and work. We ask all this through your Son. Amen.